Hello and welcome to our new video on biomolecules. This is an important chapter in class 12 chemistry and we are going to cover one of the frontiers of chemistry today. Now biomolecules are important in both chemistry and biology. So don't let the title biomolecule deceive you. This is very much a chemical topic. In fact, it has the lion's share of Nobel Prizes in both uh, chemistry and physiology and medicine with a large number of uh, pure chemists or more central chemists, people who study organic or inorganic chemistry, complaining that biochemists seem to have stolen the field and half the prices are biological. Okay? This is because of how this works. This investigates the basic molecules. This topic investigates the basic molecules that lie at the foundation of how life works. In fact, biomolecules is not really um, just one of these chapters, rather it's a fundamental chapter in an entire field called biochemistry. And any college level courses that you may take in what is one of the more cutting edge fields in science will inevitably be based on this topic. So it's probably a good un uh, idea to understand it well and clearly. Okay, now what is the difference really between biomolecules and say organic molecules? Because both bio and organic mean something to do with living things, right? So, uh, biomolecules are generally found in cells, in cellulo as we say. That means that they're found in living systems, in cellular systems, right? So what does that mean? Um, we know that there was this concept of a vis vitalis, a life force that was evoked in the early uh, 1700s and in, into the early 1800s. And this uh, theory said that certain molecules possess this life force. So you can convert a living, organic, uh, living molecule into another living molecule and an inorganic dead molecule into another inorganic dead molecule. But these organic molecules and inorganic molecules are not interconvertible. This was disproved uh, let's see, this was disproved by Friedrich Weller and what he did is he converted ammonium cyanate which is decidedly inorganic into um, urea, which is definitely an organic compound. So he proved that there's no living force that distinguishes organic from inorganic compounds. And further investigations told us that, carb that organic compounds are basically just carbon-based compounds. But we've learned some more since then. Certain organic molecules, which are very large and very complex, the biomolecules that are the subject of this topic, are still generally found only in cellular forms and living organisms. They're difficult to synthesize outside, especially the bio-macromolecules, which can run for millions and millions of atoms, like DNA or protein. And the reason behind this is, is that they are produced in reactions that are catalyzed by these super efficient biocatalysts. There are two kinds of biocatalysts, enzymes and ribozymes. We'll cover them in this chapter. But it's done by super efficient biocatalysts, which are both highly selective and fast. So technically you can extract these from outside the cell and they can still produce these biomolecules. But the production is so complicated and the reactions are so specific, like you have to react with exactly this reagent and you need to perform a large number of small steps in with exactly right orientations to create these kinds of molecules that typically you need one of these biocatalysts. An, exter an external catalyst like our nickel surface for hydrogenation is nowhere near as good as this. These catalysts are extremely selective. They act Actually, the, these are large molecules. These biocatalysts are large molecules that are actually physically going to change their shape so that they form the right kind of pocket to react with the uh, reagents. Whereas any inorganic catalyst, like a nickel catalyst, it's not going to change its shape. It has some holes and pockmarks, and if the molecules fit in, well, good luck. If they don't, you know, it's bad luck. So this kind of specific reaction is what makes biomolecules unique because they are typically created in reactions catalyzed by these catalysts. Now, these biomolecules also have a great structure. Uh, they, they stand out in terms of their structure. They are typically very large molecules, so they have a large molecular structure, which we'll study. They also have a large supramolecular structure. Now, the molecular structure starts off as a simple uh, structural formula, the kinds we draw, the bond line structures, right? Like you will have seen that uh, this is a 1, 2, 1, 2 trans uh, uh, dimethyl cyclopropane. This is a 
simple structural formula, very easy to draw, very quick. And we'll start off by looking at these simple structural formulas. But then these are very large molecules. These large molecules will then fold up. They, so because they'll be very, very long chains, this would be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is just a 6 carbon long chain. If you have tens of thousands of them, then this whole thing can be approximated by a very long string. And this string is filled to curl up and get knotted with itself in many different patterns, then these in turn will all get balled up together and all of this will form a very large molecular structure. But on top of that, these will have various groups, some will be positively charged groups, some will be negatively charged groups, all of which are sticking out from here. Maybe I should use different colors for those. So there will be some uh, positively charged group over here and over here. Maybe there'll be a negatively charged group here and here. And what these positive negatively charged groups will do is that these large biomolecules will interact via these dipole forces with other large biomolecules. And then they give rise to what is called a supramolecular structure, which is even larger. And this has been a major inspiration for us. A lot of us are now nowadays trying to create these molecule-sized machines. Okay. And uh, one huge inspiration for us is supramolecular structures, where two or three different molecules will attract each other and then they'll get knotted together and physically get stuck together. This trend of following molecular machines has even led to in recent times scientists producing a little something that is like a four-wheel car, four-wheel drive car at the molecular level. It's a long molecule with these cycles that actually rotate and uh, if you pro supply energy and the molecule can move along the surface. And all these molecular sized machines are, all, are often based on this concept of supramolecular assembly. But how are these guys performing the supermolecular assembly? A chemical engineer or a scientist will perform, will use certain catalysts to bring them together in certain ways. And yes, often the supermolecular assembly is because of these biocatalysts. But at other points in time, it is self-organized. And this is referred to as an emergent property. An emergent property, an emergent property is a property that doesn't exist at the lowest levels, like at the molecular levels, but suddenly when you add a whole bunch of molecules together, there are certain properties evolved that didn't even exist in the things that you added together. Okay? So what ends up happening is that these guys get together and because of their charges and their d different dipole moments, they attract each other and form a whole very different from the sum of its parts. Okay? And all these processes take place not near equilibrium, but pretty far away from equilibrium. Now you might say, isn't equilibrium unescapable, inevitable, right? Because you might think that is the case. And that's true even for biomolecules, but generally because all these biomolecules are found in a living system, all their reactions help recreate each other. So there is a reaction by which protein helps DNA create more DNA. Then that, there's another uh, reaction by which a protein creates some RNA from this DNA. And then the reactions by which from that RNA we recreate the proteins. So all these molecules keep creating each other within our body in various reactions. And equilibrium for them is death. When we die, they attain equilibrium. Until then, our living system remains out of equilibrium and so do the reaction systems. There are hundreds of thousands of reactions taking place all over our body, which is what we're going to study okay. now. Okay, so all these various biomolecules we were talking about with all these highly specific reactions and all that hat are basically related in a set of processes known as metabolism. Metabolism is just the sum of all um, all reactions in the organism. Now you might wonder why we're defining this, the sum of all reactions in the organism. And that's because actually you can't isolate these reactions. Metabolic reactions are such that different reactions occurring in different cells will end up producing compo uh, molecules that will then travel from one cell to another and proceed in some other reaction. All these different metabolites, okay, let's write that word down.
all these different metabolites or the different biomolecules that are participating in metabolism at any given point in time are constantly on the move from cell to cell being produced in one reaction and annihilated in another. You can't study them independently of each other. They don't work that way. As soon as they're produced, they're produced by an enzyme that will also tag on a little protein. That little protein will tell some other protein that this uh, particular thing has to be shipped out of the cell and then there'll be something on that vesicle in which it's shipped out of the cell, out of the cell which will identify which cell is supposed to take it up. So they work in such an entangled way that when we want to study, this is specifically when we want to study biomolecular reactions, in the context of the native environment, we have to take account of metabolism. In the context of an artificial environment where we're trying to use these biomolecules, say we're trying to use these super efficient biocatalysts to achieve some artificial end, then metabolism becomes obviously much less if not at all relevant. But uh, we do have to consider metabolism when we're considering biomolecular, re biomolecular reactions in the native environment. And the most important thing for all these reactions, of course, is energy. Most of these reactions require a certain, all these reactions require a certain activation energy to start them off. But what is the source of that energy going to be? Well, there are many different forms of energy all around the world, sound, heat, etc. But the problem with, say, sound and heat is that they often correspond to very high entropy. They're very easily dissipated. You want an energy with an extremely low entropy value so that you can then dissipate it yourself. You can produce the heat as you move your muscles and whatnot. And that really, really low energy, uh, really low entropy, pardon me, uh, source of en energy is definitely sunlight which is symbolized by H nu. And it's used by plants in this classic reaction, 6CO2 plus 6H2O under the, uh, in presence of sunlight gives you 6O2 and glucose, whose formula is C6H12O6. In fact, this is nothing but photosynthesis, as I'm sure you guys all know. And uh, what's happening here will take a little bit of time to explain, so bear with me. This is not as simple as it looks. This H2 over here, let me... Uh, do some explanations here. This H2 over here gets broken up. It gets broken up and you have this O which is going to leave and you have the H. Actually, both of these actually come out as O2 minus and H plus and then this one will undergo reduction, that one will un undergo oxidation. I am massively oversimplifying over here. But this is effectively what happens. So this oxygen will pair up with another oxygen and it will leave as this O2. Okay. This hydrogen will first be H plus and it will be used to build up a potential difference across a protein, just like we do in our circuits. This is done by tiny, tiny molecules inside the thylakoids, inside chloroplasts, inside plant cells. Okay, so these tiny, tiny molecules on the surface of a thylakoid membrane will actually build up a potential difference by keeping protons on one side and ordinary solution on the other. So one side becomes pos if overall positively charged with respect to the surrounding neutral medium. And then suddenly when there's enough charge, the protein will unfold and let all these uh, protons, these H pluses come out. Later on they'll be reduced to H. Okay, But when that happens, the energy with which that proton current comes out is used to do something very important. It, can, it is used to create a molecule called ATP. Okay, precisely it will create 18 molecules of ATP if it's done it long enough. And then those ATP molecules are used as a source of energy. You may have studied this before. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It's the molecule in the form of which we store the energy we need. And once this ATP is produced by splitting this H2O, where did this energy effectively come from? Yeah, we use the building up of the protons uh, as a potential difference to source that current which was used to create it. But where did that energy come from? The energy of the charge. Basically, when we broke this bond, the energy of breaking this bond between O and H is stored as ATP. Now, these 18 molecules of ATP, and I've written etc. here because there are a few other energy currencies which we're not talking about right now, but ATP and other energy currencies will get, con will get broken down. ATP will convert to something called ADP and a phosphate group. And the symbol for a phosphate group is a P inside a circle or a P with the subscript I, which means inorganic phosphate. P sub I. 
okay but normally i will i then it tend to use uh, p n circles so that's what you will see throughout the uh, throughout this course or throughout these videos but if you do come across p sub i then you should know it's just the same thing as p in a circle okay so this is broken down and this is the driving force of energy right this it's what gives it the energy to do the remainder of the work what is the remainder of the work these hydrogens that came out from here we we'll use these hydrogens to reduce carbon dioxide into glucose which is a carbohydrate we'll study carbohydrates in quite a lot of detail very soon but so these h's are basically used to reduce this and the breaking of h2o is what gives us the energy which is then stored as atp and this energy is used to reach the activation energy of the reduction reaction whereas the activation energy of the breaking reaction directly comes from sunlight so i hope you understand the two different steps of the reaction this is called the light reaction breaking up the active activation energy is the sunlight then the energy of breaking this bond is used uh, to create atp and that atp provides the activation energy of this reaction and itself get uh, of basically the reduction part of the reaction 6co2 plus the h of the h2o which gives rise to the c6h12o6 so that's what's happening here okay cool now let's see what else we have so uh, we've got this 18 atp going down to adp and we remember that there are some other energy currencies etc is very important you'll see why in a moment totally this is a delta h it consumes 2880 kilojoules per mole of glucose produced but now this is respiration the exact inverse reaction literally you just flip the reaction around so when we breathe in six molecules of oxygen and one and consume one molecule of glucose we react them we oxidize the whole thing just like this was a reduction reaction and we get six co2 and six h2o if the reduction had a positive enthalpy then the oxidation the corresponding oxidation will have a negative enthalpy this is similar to how the um, electrode potential e oxidation e reduction one is the negative of the other in electrochemistry right so now what happens is the delta h is minus 2800 and uh, 80 kilojoules per mole so you would again expect just like here we had 18 atp getting turned into 18 adp right and releasing the energy you would expect that if we get the same amount of energy we can convert 18 of adp along with 18 phosphate groups into 18 atp actually we can convert 36 adp molecules with their corresponding phosphate groups into 36 atp molecules why do we want to convert these into atp molecules because again just as the plant found it convenient to store the sunlight's energy as atp by using it first to break this bond and then taking that bond breaking energy and keeping it as atp until it could use this hydrogen to reduce the co2 similarly we too find it convenient to store the energy from respiration as atp and why is it 36 and not 18 right because if you were getting 18 adp out of here that was the energy you had this should again be 18 just because of these etc there were other ener other energy currencies involved here here this is purely atp and adp in fact to be very honest with you even our body uses other currencies the difference is that ultimately we transform we convert the other energy currencies also we break them down and we use the energy released by them to create more molecules of atp so everything ultimately becomes atp and this is the energy currency of the cell why do we need this energy currency well atp forces what are known as endergonic reactions so you've heard about spontaneous and non spontaneous reactions right a spontaneous reaction just means delta g is less than 0 and what you've always been taught is that uh, or rather since 11th grade thermochemistry what you've always been taught is that if a reaction is exothermic that is not a necessary or a sufficient sufficient condition for it to actually be spontaneous sometimes an exothermic reaction may end up re reducing entropy and so the delta g would be positive but what i am going to tell you now is it's also possible for delta g to be positive and that's what's called an endergonic reaction and for the reaction to still work and it's a bit of cheating what we do essentially the same enzyme which does this reaction okay whatever the endergonic reaction is which has delta g positive enzyme is a kind of biocatalyst as i said biocatalysts have two types enzymes and ribozymes so say an enzyme or a ribozyme is trying to catalyze this reaction which is endergonic delta g greater than 0 okay the same enzyme will actually catalyze two reactions at the same time it will catalyze the endergonic reaction and it will also catalyze breaking down atp to adp 
okay adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate and in doing this breaking down that is actually a highly exergonic highly exergonic reaction it has a very very low very very negative delta g value and the total delta g of the endergonic reaction and the atp degradation will end up being negative so how does atp have this amazing energy store well we're not going to worry about the adenosine bit it has a complicated structure and we have to study it anywhere the end of the chapter so why do it now but this adenosine is linked to a phosphate group a p o o o o as we know p o 4 right h 3 p o 4 is phosphoric acid this is p o 4 3 minus phosphate group which is linked or which shares an oxygen with another p o 4 which shares an oxygen with another p o 4 hence adenosine 1 2 3 adenosine triphosphate triphosphate as you can see has some squiggly line bonds as well as straight line bonds now you have not probably seen a squiggly line bond notation before and basically a squiggly line when used to indicate a bond means that if you hydrolyze it you can get a huge amount of energy it means e easily hydrolyzable and since it is easily hydrolyzable that reaction must be very reactive and so it also means that it's a good energy source okay actually you might wonder to break a bond, I will always need energy, right? You always need energy to break any bond. Energy, you can never break a bond without supplying energy. So then how does breaking the bond supply energy? The answer is it doesn't. There are enzymes called kinases. And this is a word that you do not have to remember. I am just telling, I am just giving it to you FYI. So there are these enzymes called kinases and what they do is, they, when they break up this ATP, they actually take this phosphate group, this entire PO4-3- and they bond it to some other molecule in the cell. And binding it to another molecule is really good because this bond is fairly weak, but phosphate typically makes very strong bonds. And so you break this weak bond and you bind phosphate onto a very, uh, to something else where it forms a very strong bond, then the energy released there in the formation of the new bond will far exceed the energy released in the breakage of the old bond. And so you get these roughly constant energy values for breaking each of the bonds. So if I break the ATP and make it an adenosine diphosphate, if I break this bond, I get 31 kilojoules per mole of ATP to ADP conversion. Typically, I'll stop here and the cell will again turn the ADP back into ATP by doing uh, respiration. As you can see, that's what we do. We refuel, we turn ADP back into ATP. But sometimes the cell can go further and break this second bond and get another 31 kilojoules per mole of reactant of ATP of ADP and now we're left with adenosine monophosphate AMP and this bond the bond between the adenosine and the monophosphate can also be broken but it's a different kind of bond like these were both phosphate phosphate bonds this is an adenosine phosphate bond and so it releases much less energy 14 kilojoules but this is a is a very important thing to know that you have ATP to ADP to AMP to A and th this breakdown cycle is one of the main sources of energy. There are other triphosphates like this. Instead of adenosine triphosphate, you can also have guanosine triphosphate. This is also a used energy source. But ATP is the most common one, so I have taken that as the example. And it's the one that we produced vi via respiration. Other energy sources must gain the energy by first breaking down ATP and then putting it into that energy currency. So unless that particular uh, energy currency, that particular molecule is chemically favored for powering some reaction due to its, spe its special reactivities, we will generally stick with ATP because that is what we directly produce from uh, respiration. So this is the basic sum total of metabolism in the entire ecosystem. Plants do this and all organisms do this and they create ATP and the ATP forces endergonic reactions and this is the basic theme behind metabolism. Now, we, now that we've established how metabolism works and how all these biomolecules are interconnected via these metabolic pathways, let's talk about what the biomolecules actually are for a bit. Obviously, they're biological molecules, but what are those? Now, you may be able to recall some of the nutrients you studied about in your lower classes. And yes, most of those are actually biomolecules like proteins or carbohydrates or even vitamins. But let's try a, another way of approaching it. If you take a leaf and grind it up and mix it with an acid, such as, say, uh, 
trichloroacetic acid Cl Cl3 CCOH okay CCL3 COH whatever you like when you mix it up with uh, when you mix a crushed leaf with trichloroacetic acid and then you filter it out you will get a filtrate here shown in purple and a retentate shown here in white okay in your filtrate these things will come filtering straight out they will dissolve in the acid and will pass through your filter vitamins and minerals in your retentate however you will have carbohydrates proteins nucleic acids and lipids now there is in fact a range there's a range of different sizes into which these categories fall based on that they divide into which these different mo molecules fall based on which they're divided into bio macromolecules and bio micromolecules so these vitamins and minerals which are in the filtrate are in the range of 18 to 800 unified mass units okay whereas most of these in the retentate are over 800 there is however one interesting exception and that is the lipids lipids are the only bio micromolecules in the retentate so you might wonder if they're small if they're 18 to 80, 800 uh, atomic mass units why didn't they dissolve in this really powerful solvent this acid when vitamins and minerals did okay by the way this is not all vitamins some vitamins are actually really small lipids these are only the vitamins which are hydrophilic not the hydrophobic vitamins i have not illustrated that that way but just for clarity i've done this uh, so why is it that lipid stayed behind and the answer is that this acid is a highly hydrophilic thing right whereas lipids are hydrophobic they are highly hydrophobic okay and there are some eight different types of them so they don't have a single common chemical motif different there are eight different types of chemical structures which are all lumped together as lipids because lipids are hydrophobic now what does that do that means for example that the ordinary lipids which have this kind of structure the simple fats which is the most famous type of lipid fats have this kind of structure you might remember that fats are esters of fatty acid and glycerol and here is the glycerol part which is basically a 1 comma 2 comma 3 tri uh, propan uh, triol and that has been esterified with three fatty acids over here which are long chain carboxylic acids so this kind of fat mainly functions as an energy store but there's another example for instance these are used in creating what are called membranes like your cell membrane the membranes of your organelles the membranes of vesicles and what these membranes do is when you get a membrane bound pouch when you get a membrane bound pouch like this all the chemical activity that you're doing in here all the reactions all the different molecules interacting in the system are isolated and that allows life to evolve if life were an open system and we didn't have any fundamental units like cells everything would mix up and we wouldn't be able to do the reactions in a proper way so the hypo there's a hypothesis that lipids such as phospholipids which make up this membrane were actually the first molecules of life and all these other molecules and then a couple of these molecules maybe nucleic acids which are fundamental to how life works evolved inside this by uh, hooker crook and since nucleic acids like dna which is very famous contain and carry information and can direct the creation of these other molecules they then began creating this and the entirety of the living system was born but how does this phospholipid work well the phospholipid is like an ordinary fat except it has these phosphate groups stuck on just like we spoke about before with atp and the phosphate group is ionic but this whole thing is not ionic this this whole part over here is actually hydrophobic so what ends up happening is you will have this hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head and maybe i'll put them in different colors to underline the message the head is hydrophilic so if you have water somewhere if i have water over here then this head will keep seeking it so i'll have all these different phospholipids all of them trying to enter this water which is the say your blood or some other fluid outside your cells okay and then again there's water in the form of the cytoplasm inside the cell and again you will have phospholipids trying to mix into this water because they're ionic but these phospholipids also have tails 
and these tails being hydrophobic will dissolve and mix into each other and in this way this whole thing will form a membrane between the two fluids the inner fluid and the outer fluid okay so i can also add an outer fluid here and this this membrane forms and that is what a cell membrane is okay i've covered lipids already here in some detail because they don't re reoccur anywhere in the syllabus you just have to know that they're used for energy storing that this is the fat which is the simplest kind of lipid and that phospholipids make up the membrane using a missile like structure once you know this there's nothing else to know about lipids in our syllabus we mainly focus on carbohydrates proteins and nucleic acids and we'll tackle each and every one of these topics a video at a time Thank you.